Hello and welcome to the latest episode in the Urban Manifesto webinar series. I'm Lucy Bullivant, I'm the founder of urbanista.org and together with Prathima Manoha, the founder of Urban Vision, we have pooled our skills and resources to create a third platform, um, Urban Manifesto, a third online platform. Um, because the pandemic and transitioning through into a new era has raised some really profound questions about the priorities, the processes and the, um, uh, the whole uh, visions, potential visions and, uh, and motivating forces uh, behind urban design and planning. It's undoubtedly the case that there is, is currently and will be um, step changes of small and large natures that will really change the shape of our world. Um, we need more of them. Um, we need to ask what are the most meaningful um, strategies, whether they be fast track tactical or uh, slower, longer term ones that will really pr produce profound change. Today's theme is making um, cities more mobile. And in a minute, Prathama will introduce the theme in more detail and our splendid guest today. Um, the idea behind the Urban Manifesto is uh, to create, together with the help of um, a number of expert guests from many different disciplines and different continents around the, the world, more, moreover, um, a series of strategies and, and just to pinpoint and crystallise priorities for a happier, healthier, a more livable, and that means more equitable urban future as, as we go forward. We're very pleased to be part of the 100 Day Studio, which is being uh, staged online by the Architecture Foundation. Now, through meeting the challenges brought about by the pandemic, through unlearning, um, unlearning old ways which have lost their meaning or are actually really deemed to be downright helpful um, in the 21st century. Um, our, our Urban Manifesto will be a real uh, roadmap for resilient, progressive and responsible urban change. So over to you, Prathama, to introduce the theme. Thank you, Lucy. Um, Transport is the backbone of our cities and many cities have been uh, in a way forced to curtail public transport uh, during this health crisis. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, transit agencies around the world saw their ridership decline by almost 90%. A lot of cities have been responding to this crisis by improving pedestrian access to ensure more social distancing um, and are also turning to cycling as a robust and resilient and a dependable alternative to move around our cities. Um, over the last few months where uh, many cities across the world have experienced various stages of lockdown, many cycling systems in our urban areas from China to United Kingdom to United States have seen a surge in traffic um, and many cities uh, are responding to this new reality by opening up new tactical bike lanes. These changes are um, in a way transformative and can lay a roadmap for a city that is fair, healthy, efficient, uh, with a high quality of life for all its residents. And this is the theme that we are going to explore today. And we are so thrilled to have Peter Murray with us today uh, to discuss this very important topic. He's the curator in chief of uh, New London Architecture and he's the chairman of the London Society. Uh, we were to also have another guest, uh, which was in our original schedule with uh, Shaba Stewart from Brooklyn in um, the US. Uh, he's the CEO of ONE. We are hoping he can still join us, but there's been some emergency in one of his sites. So 
he'll probably not make it. But we're so excited that Peter is here with us today. And Peter, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, how are you doing and how have you been doing during this, uh, you know, pandemic? Well, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you for inviting me. Um, so far, so good, really. Um, I haven't uh, caught corona uh, virus <laughs> at, at, at all myself. I've been in lockdown, but being able to get out on my bicycle and do a bit of riding around town and uh, seeing lots of other cyclists out in the street as well, and also sampling some of the uh, new uh, pop-up infrastructure, which you just mentioned, uh, which is being delivered uh, uh, right around London at the moment. Peter, one of the things that's become a tradition in this um, show has been our uh, segment of Urban Manifesto, where we request our uh, speakers to share their brief three-point agenda or plan um, for better urban futures, and in this case, um, on how to make our cities more mobile. So, Peter, what is your three-point agenda uh, for a better city life? Right. Well, uh, three points uh, aimed uh, specifically at how we move around cities. I start and uh, I think we have an image there of uh, uh, what is called Bank Junction in the City of London. This is an image that I did a few years ago. Bank Junction is the key to the uh, centre of the City of London. Now, uh, for those who don't know the difference between City and the City of Lon London is that um, uh, the a uh, historic centre, which we also nicknamed the Square Mile, is the central business district. So the City of London is really where the uh, financial services are, the banks and so on. And it's a small uh, a square mile within the larger, greater London area. But uh, this is Bank Junction, which at the moment is a uh, basically a junction with seven roads coming into it. It has been in the past very dangerous, uh, uh, far too busy, far too much traffic, and actually a cause of much congestion. So uh, a year or so ago, the City of London did put in temporary infrastructure to limit the use of the space to just buses and cyclists. But I painted this because I actually think it ought to uh, be used as a public space, because it's really the centre of uh, the city of london really important public space and so uh, you know that part of my manifesto is that uh, uh, streets must be seen as the most important public spaces in the city i mean they are uh, both they cover a large area and they are very significant in the way we move around the city so they must be seen as public spaces and they should be designed for people and not for cars so that's number one um, uh, number number two, and uh, this is an image of uh, Cheapside, which actually leads into Bank Junction. Now, Cheapside is the oldest high street, the oldest retail street in London. And uh, it, at the moment, it still has shops going down it, but it is a mix of uh, traffic running through it, as well as uh, cyclists and pedestrians. Now, I did this uh, picture more recently. And this is to show it really being used as a shared space. So I think that also streets should be seen as social spaces and they should be seen as spaces of consideration between users and not ones of conflict. And uh, I'm a great supporter of shared space when it is properly designed and uh, one that allows uh, people to uh, use space using different modes, but using it considerably and with respect for others in that space. And then my third one, and uh, the image here is of Soho, also in central London, but not a part of the city of London itself. Soho, uh, that, this image shows a, the street being used for restaurants. And this was an image I drew really to accentuate the fact that during uh, a period of social distancing, Restaurants need to be able to use the street as a way, place where they could actually put tables and uh, the people can dine there uh, quite safely. So uh, what we need is more low traffic areas, residential areas, 
and uh, commercial areas uh, that uh, do are not full of uh, cars uh, speeding through or indeed delivery vehicles. So in residential uh, areas, children should be able to play in quiet streets. Entertainment areas like Soho uh, also should have low traffic when people are wanting to use the streets, where pedestrians or cyclists. And uh, I think the, the the easiest way to look at these low traffic areas is on the example of uh, Barcelona, super grids in Barcelona, where uh, uh, four by four grids are uh, put together. The outer roads of those uh, that four by four is used for uh, through traffic, uh, but inside those uh, uh, sixteen grids, uh, you have a uh, an area where pedestrians have priority, and it creates a neighbourhood and social space where uh, children can play. So those are my three things with uh, particular respect to how we move around cities and how we use streets as public spaces. Peter, that's a grand vision for a very vibrant and fun city. And I hope our you know, future of uh, cities will have that kind of an urban life. Well, let's hope so. And uh, one of the uh, places which I focused on there was the uh, C City of London. And uh, the City of London has actually a transport strategy, which I think is is one, one of the, the best I know of, of any uh, ma major city around the world. And at the moment, it has the advantage that some 93% of people actually travelling into the City of London, uh, they come using active travel. So they either come by uh, walking, cycling or public transport. So uh, it actually is is a, a splendid place to start looking at how you deliver better space for uh, walking and, and cycling within uh, the city because the city of London has the advantage that it's the, it's the historic core of London. And, mm. of course, in the medieval period, it was a, a pedestrian uh, uh, city at, at that stage. People uh, didn't, didn't have cars, maybe a few horses, but it was essentially built uh, for people to walk. And mm. there's no reason why people can't walk through it and, and in it uh, today. Yeah, fantastic. Um, I can't help but notice the comment by one of our viewers, Ashok Gol, who has um, made the, the point that in India, all the planning is been being done for the car and not for people. All the roads are for motor vehicles, not for humans. And uh, looking out of uh, my window or when I'm on my bike in London, I can't help but feel that, um, yeah, in some parts of London, the cars really have vehicles, have come back with a vengeance um, in the last uh, couple of weeks uh, as we're now, you know, what, three months into lockdown. Um, the One of the very best of the sustainable transport um, experts, professor at uh, University of California in Berkeley, Robert Severo, um, made a very interesting point a while back when he said that planning of the automobile city focuses on saving time, whereas planning for the accessible city, on the other hand, focuses on time well spent. Now, under lockdown, getting out to spend time well in public space, whether we cycle, go for a walk and or have access to nature, has really taken on a new meaning, as you know, so we all su have suffered from so-called cabin fever. Um, Peter, um, it re we're really interested to know what particular initiatives that you've spotted around London um, to make uh, it, the city more sustainably notice, uh, mobile have you noticed during lockdown? And um, are you observing any changes that have been made by the Mayor of London or by the different uh, local councils? Um, of all 31 of them um, in one domain, influencing operations in another. Um, and, and overall, you know, which trends are likely to be a big part of urban mobility futures? That's three questions in one. Sorry for that. <laughs> That's okay. Well, I'll start off uh, not uh, so much talking about London as uh, uh, the UK as a whole, actually, which yeah. has seen a quite significant shift and mm. uh, we have a uh, a Minister of Transport called Grant Chaps, who announced mm. a whole lot of changes recently. Now, I remember 
that our Prime Minister Boris Johnson is a keen cyclist. And uh, one of his moves when he was elected uh, last year, as uh, in, in the government was elected, and he became prime minister. He put a chap called Andrew Gilligan, um, who was his cycling tsar when Boris Johnson was mayor of London. And he put Andrew Gilligan into the Ministry of Transport. And uh, the Ministry of Transport, normally a very conservative and uh, rather slow moving organisation, has actually now, as a result of COVID-19, produced what is the largest ever boost for cyclists and uh, pedestrians. And this is you know, across the nation, not just in London, with emergency bike lanes and streets to help support the public transport ne uh, network. They're now doing trials of rental e-scooters. Um, mm -hmm. And we've been very slow to uh, respond to e-scooters in Britain up until now. Uh, yeah. the, the government is also working with leading tech developers uh, to look at how they can uh, reduce uh, crowding in public transport, that sort of thing. So um, mm. the Prime Minister is also going to launch a new cycling and walking investment strategy uh, it, sometime this summer, which will look at delivering uh, a way of doubling cycling and increased walking by 2025. And th these are quite big moves, as I say, for mm. a department of government that has been traditionally... Uh, very slow to uh, respond. And that links up to national health and there is pressure to get uh, doctors to prescribe cycling and exercise to their patients to keep them healthier and hopefully reduce their dependency on the national uh, health system. So uh, I think all that is really uh, building up a whole lot of pressure to uh, get uh, people um, uh, walking and cycling more during this period. But uh, for me, the important thing is how do we make these things uh, uh, permanent rather than then just all the plastic bollards and uh, ones uh, swept away as soon as uh, uh, we uh, come out of this current situation. I think it's very important that you know, stuff is well designed, which is put up at the moment. And the mayor of London, mm. and you asked about boroughs, one of the things that people need to understand is the mayor of London he only uh, uh, is able to control about 10% of our, our sort of strategic uh, streets in the capital. Most of the streets and roads are actually controlled by the boroughs, uh, which makes it very difficult to have a London-wide uh, strategy for dealing with these things. And mm. so uh, we're finding that the, the, the mayor has a really good policy of taking these bigger roads, which he looks after uh, using generally light segregation to... Uh, increased space for cyclists and also widening pavements so that uh, uh, people can social distance. But also mm. some, some of the boroughs are also uh, delivering uh, improved conditions for cycling and walking and others are uh, rather slower off, off, off the mark. Because mm. one of the really interesting things, and this is, this is pretty important to how this has been delivered, that um, up until now, Local authorities weren't quite sure how on earth they delivered all these changes. But mm. what is it, they, you know, it's made more obvious is that uh, you can put in what are called experimental infrastructure, and that can be done without uh, full uh, uh, public consultation. And also temporary work can be put in without public consultation. And mm. so uh, the idea is, and uh, certainly... Uh, this is the desire of the mayor and of the government too, is that uh, when these things are put in, then uh, they should be studied, see how they work, with a, a hope that they will become permanent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, it's really refreshing. And uh, I, um, I've i returned to my bicycle after giving it up some time ago. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it is, is really, really ground shifting at the moment. And uh, as you say, I think the tactical urbanism, that phrase is not very well known by, by the wider public. And it, it deserves to be because there, everyone is encountering these, um, these very, very quick, these remarkably fast changes to, to all their streets. Um, it is really quite, quite um, uplifting, I must say, during a most um, very, very strange period in history. So, um, well, that, uh, yes, there, there, there is a problem, though, that the, 
uh, as you say, when you look out of your uh, window now, and mm. I've been cycling, uh, well, today I've been out cycling, and certainly the number of cars now coming into London is mm. huge. People are concerned about getting into the underground because of uh, uh, the problems of uh, uh, spreading the, the virus. So people are in their cars, and there is uh, quite a lot of resistance among car drivers who actually uh, think that uh, you know, it, it's really restricting their freedoms, not being able to move around as e easily as they used to. But I do yeah. think that car drivers have to be have to understand that in the city of the future, uh, we will move around in different ways. And having totally free use of cars around the city is no longer a possibility. Mm -hmm. um, I can't... I can't help but um, point out that you have a Brompton bike, your folding Brompton bike in your back background and uh, in next to your library. Um, we need to do a shout out to Brompton, surely, for their uh, tremendous work in uh, providing Brompton bikes to NHS uh, key workers. Tell us that story, would you? Yes, well, it, it uh, was realised fairly early on that actually uh, people working in the National Health Service, uh, nurses and doctors and so on, were having to go to work on public transport, which was thought yeah. to uh, increase their risk of uh, uh, catching uh, COVID-19. And uh, so uh, Brompton came up with the idea of giving uh, bikes for heroes. So uh, they uh, made a thousand of their bicycles uh, painted in the uh, NHS uh, blue and uh, they were uh, distributed to uh, doctors and nurses so that they could uh, cycle to work much more easily uh, on a, a, a Brompton and, and Bromptons are I think a, a really important um, tool, one of the tools for delivering more active travel because one of the benefits of Brompton is that you can actually take them onto public transport. In London, you're allowed to take them onto the underground, even mm. in periods when bicycles aren't normally allowed. Mm. I think integrating cycling with public transport is really important. It, it's easier in, in, in some countries with more surface transport. Uh, underground, obviously mm. quite difficult to take uh, large bicycles down into deep tubes in London, but taking mm. a Brompton is really uh, straightforward, simple. It doesn't take up too much space in the uh, the carriages, and it allows you to really move around London uh, in, with incredible ease. I, I use them all the time, both yeah. in the centre. If I'm going out to the outer London, the suburbs, I can just put it on uh, the surface uh, rail or on the uh, metropolitan tube, and I can get out to areas in outer London. But probably. Uh, the quickest possible way to uh, get get there. Yeah, good. So good on them. Uh, good on you, Brompton. And uh, as we've been reading and hearing on the uh, news, the the tragic uh, reality that the pandemic infection is growing in in other parts of the world, like uh, uh, beyond the ones it already is, like in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, and in the global South. Moreover. Um, if every, if bicycle manufacturers in every city in the world could consider a similar initiative to Brompton to to help the key workers move around without having to get on to the BRTs, um, that would be really fantastic. Um, Prathamo, next question. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, Peter, your uh, ideas of, you know, some of these pop-up tactical uh, uh, interventions that we're seeing across the world, especially like by cycling infrastructure and walking infrastructure, you know, those are really crucial to a great urban life, but also to sustainability. And uh, I hope, like you said, uh, we will see some of these changes to be a more permanent part of our city infrastructure, uh, because one of the things if we, you know, go beyond the current moment that we are uh, living through, the biggest crisis that faces all of us as humanity is climate change. And um, in a way, cities are at the heart of that crisis. You know, I, uh, there was a statistic put out by uh, UN which said that 
cities barely occupy 2% of the world's surface area, but we are responsible for 75% of global energy consumption and 80% of greenhouse gas emissions. And if you studied the ecological footprint, the energy footprint of any city, uh, you know that 50% of the carbon em emissions in our cities are linked through transport. So I hope, uh, you know, your prophecy that some of these, um, you know, green mobility ideas like walking and cycling uh, will uh, come, you know, will become a more regular part of our life. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've seen that over the last couple of decades, while there have been reduction in energy use uh, in other sectors, transport sector has consistently increased its energy footprints. Um, you know, I'd love to know from you, uh, uh, you know, within your work, what are you doing to improve sustainable urban mobility? Well, I've, I've, I've across a, a, a number of routes, I, I would guess some some of them personal, some of them through New London architecture, and some of them uh, within uh, local groups here. And uh, I would guess one of the key things I look back on, which was uh, I felt was really important to my development in terms of understanding uh, how one uh, changed attitudes to cars, was in 2013 I cycled across uh, the US from Portland, Oregon uh, to New York. And then we cycled on uh, to London, crossing over Ireland and uh, Wales and England before we got to London. And uh, the aim of that was to actually cycle uh, through the States and look at what American cities were doing to improve uh, the lot of cyclists. And uh, we were inspired by what was happening in New York. And we knew uh, quite a lot about the work that uh, Janet Sadiq Khan, as uh, Commissioner for Department of Transportation, uh, was doing there. And also we were aware of, of Portland, Oregon, as being a centre for cycling. And so uh, that's why we started to, we decided to start in, in Portland. Uh, so uh, we uh, went, went, went to Portland and uh, uh, one of the really interesting things at Portland, they had, you know, pretty good infrastructure. But I have to say one of the really uh, things that we noticed so much they had really considerate motorists. And uh, so uh, the consideration of road users was a key part of, of how it really uh, worked as, as a city. And I thought that was, that was a really important message to take back because one of the things about studying in the States, people said, you know, why are you, why are you going to the States to look at this? Why don't you go to Rotterdam or Copenhagen or something like this? Uh, because uh, they're, they're you know, way ahead of the game. But actually, I think that uh, in the UK, we have certain things in common uh, uh, with a lot of American cities and the love of the car and the, the people not wanting to give them up, I think, is key part of that. It was very really interesting to see the interaction between the two in the States. Uh, as I say, we, we cycled right across the States, 4,000 miles, and it was really uh, not, uh, we, we, we found the consideration of uh, uh, both cars and trucks, really much better than we found in, in the UK. We went to Minneapolis, which has got some really good uh, cycling infrastructure. And uh, we could talk about the, the sort of changing shape of the city, how uh, younger uh, people uh, were moving into sort of the inner ring uh, just outside the center, cycling into work and uh, using um, really excellent routes built into the place. We also find cycling across uh, uh, the uh, large uh, parts of the, the, the country. There were some really good off-road routes as well, uh, not in towns, but uh, you know through the countryside, which worked really well. Uh, we went to uh, Chicago, where uh, again there was a, a plan. At that this was 2013. They had a plan to deliver lots of cycling infrastructure by 2020. And one of the things that you really noticed in Chicago is the, the benefit of the gridded city. That's something we don't have in London. We don't have any grids at all, really, to speak of in London. And uh, gridded cities are much easier to uh, deliver uh, this sort of infrastructure to than the more complex layouts of uh, UK cities. Uh, we went to uh, Pittsburgh, 
where the local community has been fighting really hard to improve uh, infrastructure, uh, the relationship between buses and bikes. So bikes can be attached to uh, buses to so that people can uh, use uh, both modes of transport. Uh, we went to Philadelphia, where uh, the, the gridded system there works really well uh, to provide uh, protected routes. And they'd built, when we were there, some really good uh, uh, cycleways uh, with really good sustainable urban drainage, landscaping, uh, uh, really exemplar projects. And then, of course, we got to New York. And New York is amazing in that they have delivered this uh, huge uh, uh, number of miles of uh, uh, cycling infrastructure. A lot of it at that stage done uh, very cheaply because uh, a lot of it was paint and pots, uh, painted uh, routes on the road, uh, pots as uh, uh, protection from cyclists and uh, uh, from uh, cars, uh, between cars and pedestrians. So uh, we looked at ways that, uh, you know, things we could learn uh, from uh, all those cities. Uh, one of the advantages, of course, Jeanette said it Khan had in New York, and uh, Bill de Blasio still does have that, that the uh, commissioner for the uh, Department of Transportation has much more power over roads uh, throughout New York than uh, the uh, the mayor does in London. And being able to deliver uh, that, as you say, Lucy, that tactical urbanism at mm. speed, you know, uh, Times Square was changed uh, with, with paint and pots over, over one weekend. Then you could see how did it work? And then uh, as after it's been working for a year, people would say, gosh, this has got to be permanent because it's so, we, we never want to go back to the hell hole it was before. Mm. So, uh, so we went across the states and we produced a report for Boris Johnson uh, after we got back and uh, told him of our findings. So that was one of the things we, uh, I did, that was myself and a dozen of us, we did that ride, uh, of architects and planners. And at New London Architecture, we do all sorts of research. And, uh, uh, this, is, this is one on uh, uh, public city, places for people, um, civilizing spaces. We've uh, just had an exhibition on future streets and uh, all that sort of stuff. We keep an eye on how attitudes are changing and how we can in influence stuff. And then more locally here, um, I'm chairman of, I live in a place called Bedford Park, which when it was built in the 1880s was advertised by the developer as the healthiest place in the world, only six deaths per thousand. Don't know what those statistics meant, but it was good marketing. And uh, so uh, we're trying to make sure that our area in the future should have healthy streets, healthier ways of living. And so the Bedford Park Bicycle Club is there to uh, encourage new cyclists to, to join us, have rides around the place and look at how we can improve the local area uh, for uh, local people to cycle, to get to the shops. And uh, uh, the COVID-19 uh, infrastructure is really helping that, us in that. So our mm -hmm. local shopping street is being turned into a, uh, uh, you know, through traffic is being uh, taken out of it, essential traffic access only. And that would be a great experiment, which would have been really hard to have done before. Great experiment where we see that this works. Hopefully, people will see that it's much, much better than it was before, and it will become permanent. So I would say I'm working across uh, um, uh, uh, the various levels of sort of personal levels, professional level and local level to convince people that uh, they should get uh, uh, walking or cycling. And I think the job of uh, people like me and indeed people like you uh, who are in the communications game, as it were, is to keep banging home the message that this has happened. You know, what we're about is changing attitudes and it takes time to change these attitudes, but you've just got to keep on, keep on repeating and repeating the mantra. And the best thing, you know, coming out of COVID-19, it is accelerating a whole series of things which we were hoping would happen, but have been taking a really long time. This is... I think speeding them up. That's nice to hear uh, some positive news out of the COVID-19 nightmare. And uh, your trip across US and UK sounds fascinating and lots of fun. How many miles did you cover in between states and 
UK. Uh, well, from, from, uh, the miles we covered from London, uh, from uh, Portland to London, uh, was uh, uh, four thousand miles, or, or wow. we, although we say six thousand kilometres, because it, it, it sounds more. So, uh, wow. that, that, that was, <laughs> how many uh, days was this over? Uh, we took uh, two months, thirteen days, oh. and uh, but uh, if you cycled all the time, it wouldn't take you that long. But we, we stayed in uh, each city we were looking at for two to three days and we met up with members of the local uh, departments of transportation, uh, yeah. local cycling activists. And uh, there is a, a, a movie on my channel on YouTube which actually uh, will take you uh, all the way through and includes interviews with uh, all sorts of people from Janet Sadiq Khan uh, to Paul Steely White who ran Transalt and uh, uh, people from... Uh, cycling uh, community uh, right, right across the states. Mm. Um, but there, there, there was one area of, of uh, act, act activity which I, I guess I just didn't mention, and one is that that, that is I, I'm a mayor's design advocate in, in, in London uh, uh, under Sadiq Khan, and I was also a, uh, a member of Boris Johnson's uh, design advisory group in the previous administration. And uh, in that previous administration, we, we wrote uh, a document which I edited called uh, 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 Good Growth. And uh, uh, in that, uh, one of the key things I was absolutely uh, insistent that we would uh, put into that document was that the next administration uh, should actually create a walking and cycling commissioner, not just a cycling commissioner that uh, uh, Boris Johnson had had. had. And uh, so this was in the document, and then uh, it was uh, really good that uh, Sadiq Khan, when he uh, took office, did take on uh, most of the suggestions within this good growth document. Uh, and his policy, good growth by design, is what Mayor's Design Advocates are really promoting. And one of the key parts of that policy, which has been implemented, is that we have a walking and cycling commissioner uh, for London, that called Will Norman. Who is very active and uh, is again like us, you know, pushing uh, for better and cleaner streets and healthier streets and uh, better places. So let's um, focus um, now on safety because if we are going to persuade people who've never cycled in their lives or people like me who got completely fed up with the uh, the dangerous nature of cycling London, but now I've come back to it. Uh, so I've, I've been persuaded by the current uh, initiatives. Um, we need we need um, we need good uh, studies. We need well, we already have got some very good studies. And uh, in fact, literally today I read a very surprising thing, which is that London has space for almost. 1,500 more miles of segregated cycle routes, um, it, which the Bartlett School of Architecture at UCL has found on one sixth of the roads. So if that was implemented, and uh, apparently that could potentially be implemented fairly quickly or more quickly than say HS2 or um, our national high-speed rail um, uh, project, um, moving towards a genuinely comprehensive cycle network in the city um, would really, really be help to overcome lack of safety as a deterrent. What do you think are some of the critical steps that other cities can take to become more safer for both pedestrians and cyclists? It seems to me that has to be uh, not only a cross-sector effort, but it has to be truly multi uh, multimedia design effort as well. I mean, how much also do protected lanes really matter for a safe biking experience? And uh, and and then it, this raises the question also of how bikes can be better integrated with public transit infrastructure. Uh, well, I, I guess that you know what, one one of the key issues about delivering uh, segregated routes is that. Uh, one of the main reasons why people uh, don't take up cycling is because they're worried about safety issues mm -hmm. and they certainly feel safer uh, when they are in segregated lanes. But mm -hmm. I, I don't think that uh, you need to have segregated lanes everywhere. 
uh, there should be plenty of streets in cities which are calmer and quiet enough for people to uh, be in uh, shared modes and uh, there should be uh, other uh, areas which don't have uh, traffic in at all, uh, mm -hmm. the narrower streets and so on, which can be turned over to uh, purely cyc cycling and walking. And mm -hmm. I think that uh, one of the really interesting uh, pieces of work, and I, which I think other cities could follow, uh, was a, a piece of work done by uh, uh, the what's called the Urban Task Force, and a report uh, produced by Transport for London, of which one of the key elements of it was uh, called the, the Family of Streets. Mm. And this basically looked at uh, nine different uh, street types. It was uh, drawn out on a square grid, uh, three by three. Top uh, left-hand corner uh, were streets that were just for uh, fast movement. And these are places you wouldn't want to cycle in at all anyway. And if you did, you would absolutely have to have uh, a, a segregated route. Then mm. down in the bottom right-hand corner of the grid, uh, you have those places which are largely pedestrian areas, uh, uh, squares, uh, plazas, areas that where uh, people would not expect to be uh, uh, wanting to move. So you had this, this shaded shift from movement uh, to uh, slower uh, spaces uh, where people would gather and uh, you know, enjoy themselves, sit out and uh, uh, mm -hmm. would not uh, was, wish to be uh, troubled. Uh, by by traffic. So once you understand the different sorts of streets you have, uh, then you can look at what is the right sort of infrastructure uh, to uh, have. So I mean, if you look at uh, in the in the city of London, their view is that if you keep the traffic volumes below 150 vehicles an hour in each direction, uh, then uh, uh, then you could actually allow people to uh, uh, cycle uh, if you give priority to cycling over motor vehicles so that that's a way that's where you could uh, create that shift if you've got more um, uh, motorists than that then you need to put in some sort of uh, uh, measures to uh, protect uh, one from the other and one of the interesting things in London we, we we've been putting in a, a lot of really quite heavy segregated infrastructure and digging up the roads huge curbs and uh, a lot of uh, change, whereas actually uh, there is quite a lot of evidence now to show that light segregation uh, works pretty well and uh, a lot of the uh, stuff that has been put in in the last few weeks obviously is uh, light segregation. And I think we will see a comeback of, of lighter segregation, which will allow it to be more flexible, uh, less, far less costly and mm. uh, deliverable. But mm. uh, I would say that Segregated routes are essential in busily traffic streets, uh, less uh, busy streets, uh, you can uh, share the space and uh, in places where people are gathering, I think you could still have cycling in them, uh, but you wouldn't have any cars. Yeah, yeah. Very sound, very sound. Thank you. You know, I want to talk about the fact in a more philosophical way, the uh, sidewalks and the bike infrastructure in any city, in a way, is about equity, um, and in a in a way, it reflects the city's humanity and democracy. Um, large part of the, um, you know, in a city like Mumbai, for example, over fifty five percent of people walk or cycle as their uh, you know basic mobility each day but we somehow don't seem to be in investing in uh, uh, walkable infrastructure or biking infrastructure i remember a, a mayor from a south american uh, city once said that a developed city a developed city is one where uh, you know the rich take public transport or bike or walk uh, and not uh, you know, and not where the rich uh, use cars. So, you know, if we go back into this um, big block that most cities have against this type of infrastructure, why, why is it, you know, why do so many cities around the world 
um, you know, have this ideology that gives higher priority for car centric infrastructure than people centric infrastructure like cycling or, um, you know, pedestrian and uh, oriented infrastructure. And why, uh, if we could think, if you could answer why, I'd lo love to hear from you. How do we overcome this resistance and get people to give up their cars, uh, which really have to be dismantled um, if uh, we are going to make space for the biking infrastructure? One of our um, uh, audience members also comment on this, commented on this issue. Uh, Mr. Goel said people use car for transport, not for transport, but to show off their luxury lifestyle in a way. So uh, I guess that summarizes the philosophical angle, but I'd love to have you kind of dig deep into it a bit. Well, I, I understand absolutely your point about traffic in uh, Indian cities. I was in Hyderabad just before Christmas in November and uh, I literally could not get out of my hotel, or I was too scared, you might say, to get out of my hotel uh, without getting in a taxi to drive me out, uh, just because you couldn't cross the road without uh, uh, taking uh, one's life in one's hands. And uh, you had to be a really experienced road crosser, uh, you know, a local person who knew it, to be able to do it without feeling absolutely terrified. So uh, I think you're absolutely right. You need to bring some justice to roads. and. One of the most depressing things in London, I think, in uh, last year or so, is that the, um, uh, the the sale of SUVs, you know, large trucks, which have no place in uh, cities, is increasing, and everyone's buying SUVs uh, rather than uh, what they should be buying if they're buying cars at all. Is small electric vehicles uh, mm. that uh, are, are better accommodated in the urban environment? But I think that. Uh, you know, first of all, uh, people like getting into their cars and having their own space. There is something about that that they, particularly in an uh, alienating city, uh, there is something that is com comforting about being in your own space. You've got your entertainment there. Uh, you, you, it, it, you have climate control, all sorts of things that actually make it a nice place to be. And, of course, you have a huge amount of uh, advertising which actually sells the benefits of having those cars as well you know if you think that the the, the might say the cycling revolution we're talking about um uh, is basically being uh, brought about by uh, activists cyclists people agitating no money at all apart from subscriptions they might be able to collect from uh, their constituency uh, but these uh, groups have been up against multi-million uh, pound and dollar advertising uh, from uh, car companies uh, selling the, the benefits of their, their, their products. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I think uh, the, the, uh, the, the cycling walking lobbyists have done really well in the face of that, particularly uh, when you look at the, uh, the fact that, uh, you know, car manufacturing is really important to national economies. So it has even further support by uh, governments that they continue to uh, carry on uh, producing lo lots of cars because it means jobs and one can un un understand that. But I think also very importantly that uh, uh, cars are seen as signs of social advancement so that, uh, you know, there are a lot of people who see uh, riding a bicycle something that uh, uh, certainly it was a time when that was uh, something people cycled to factories in. So it was a uh, you know, working class people used bicycles. And then as you moved up the uh, social ladder, uh, then you had a car. And I think uh, uh, that feeling is, is still the same. People like uh, to show that they uh, are, ha have a car, they have a nice car. And uh, some years ago, there was uh, some very interesting research, which the commission uh, uh, for architecture and the built environment did into housing design. And uh, one of the key things I remember from that uh, uh, was that in the design of housing estates, it was very important to people that they should be able to park their car on the driveway outside their house so that uh, moving to a new estate 
was seen as a sign of social advancement, but also was having the right car sitting outside their house, not in the garage. They didn't park it in the garage, left it outside so that people could understand uh, how they had moved up in the world. I think that's perfectly understandable uh, that uh, people want to do that, uh, but it's not great uh, for the environment. And then I think that in the, you know, the, the the growth of the car in cities really started to rocket after World War II. And that, that time, socially, uh, you know, cars were really acceptable. And if you look at, for instance, any of the uh, perspectives drawn by architects and planners in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, they would show public space as being, uh, you know, dual carriageways, uh, freeways with uh, latest uh, models of cars on them, people whizzing around cities uh, on uh, these uh, very efficient looking new pieces of infrastructure. And that's a real contrast to what you see now uh, because uh, architects and planners, they deliver a, a computer generated image and all those spaces are now full of uh, people walking and cycling uh, trees a sustainable urban drainage, all that sort of thing. And, and so attitudes have changed. But you want to realise that up until, you know, Jane Jacob started to change things, reactions against motorways running through the centre of London started mm. to change things in the 60s and uh, early 70s. There was a shift, but it's taken all the time until now to really change the attitudes that we have to deal with uh, cities in a different way. Because it actually took us a really long time to work out that the more roads you build, the more car ownership grows to fill them. And uh, it, 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 it's really, uh, you know, there was a time, it, I, would, I would guess, yes, yeah, 60s, 70s, 80s, everyone thought, let's build more roads and then everything will be fine. But within uh, you know, a few years, all those advantages are lost. There's more people buy cars and fill the space that's uh, available. I think we understand that now, and even the transport planners in government understand that now, and hopefully uh, we won't see that as a policy in the future. You're right. I think there's just layers of uh, philosophical, economical, um, and social reason for uh, why cars you know, continue to thrive on in our cities, even though we all know they're bad for our health because of all the pollution and they're really bad. Um, they're probably the biggest uh, culprit uh, as we battle climate change. And and I guess it's uh, one of the audience members, uh, Arjun writes that if, um, if government increases the frequency of public transport system, people will use less cars. So hopefully we can see uh, more wisdom from our policymakers to change, uh, to make public transit and biking more comfortable for all of us. So uh, we can move towards those forms of more sustainable and healthier forms of transit instead of sticking with the cars. Yes, well, we we definitely need, all cities need a huge investment in uh, public transport. And you know, London has been unlucky in one way, but lucky too. It's unlucky in that we uh, started our underground system very early on. So actually quite a lot of it is, is out of date. And uh, for the last 10 years, been a lot of investment to uh, make it work more efficiently. And now it's, it's doing pretty well. As I say, if you look at uh, the City of London, the central business district in London, that is well served by uh, both surface trains and underground trains. And there, uh, you know, 93 percent of people will travel in using public transport, cycling and walking. And so that is proof to exactly what uh, 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 the questioner suggests is that you put in the investment and you get uh, the benefits from that but you will still have a uh, residual resistance to people who want to bring their cars in. And so what you have to have is really active and taxable reasons uh, for stopping people going in. You know, one of the best pieces of legislation we had in London 
uh, back in, I think it must be now 2004, was the congestion charge, where people have to pay, I think, uh, I don't use it, so I'm not quite sure what the price is now, but I think it's about £12 uh, to <laughs> drive into the centre in a car. So uh, that reduced the number of cars going into the centre by uh, 30%. And uh, it, it worked. It decongested the centre for a time. The problem is now that actually all that space has been taken up uh, by uh, private hire vehicles, Uber uh, uh, and taxis of various kinds, and mm. also by multi uh, multitude of delivery vehicles delivering uh, products bought on the uh, internet. And those have now filled up all the space that was available. And so I think the most important thing that actually cities can do in the future is to bring in road use pricing. So that what you do is you actually make sure that people pay uh, to use the roads, how much they use the roads, but not just uh, roads in general, but uh, if they want to use busy city centre roads, then they actually pay much more. And if they're using it in suburban areas where there is low level of public transport, then they pay uh, less. And if they want to go in at certain times, uh, then they, they, they pay uh, more as well. And the technology is available to do this, and uh, we could easily deliver it in many cities around the world. And that would actually allow uh, authorities to control the city much better. It seems to be an absolutely essential element to uh, create a smart city in the future. Brilliant. Excellent. Um, Prathima, are we going to call for audience questions? Yeah, I've been, uh, you know, I just want to say hi to the amazing audience who've been commenting throughout our live cast. You're making a uh, lot of comments. It's really great. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us. It's uh, nice to hear all your views on a very important topic for um, a healthier, happier and more sustainable city which is how do we move around more uh, uh, sustainably. So uh, let us know if you have any questions. You can uh, just comment on the video below and we will get it. Um, and uh, we'll try to get Peter to answer uh, one or two questions. We are almost at the end of the broadcast. We've, uh, we've probably, we can go on a little bit longer than the hour that was scheduled, but uh, please, uh, write to us if you have any questions. Um, Lucy, I think it'll take a few minutes. Uh, I will curate it. Do you want to... Um, do you have any comments or questions? Yeah, I mean, um, <clears throat> I think it's important, of course, also to recognize that even cities in the world that we consider to be in the vanguard of cycling culture, you know, really, really everything is seems to be working so well, like Copenhagen, Amsterdam, Rotterdam. Uh, you know, they were cities that didn't always have a lot of bikes and uh, it wasn't always easy to cycle around. And there were actually, it was, it was due to a lot of citizen activism in the 70s, for, for example, that, that these uh, modal shifts came. I think there's one quick question that I wanted to ask you, Peter, which is, um, you know, the uh, New York's um, plan for cycling, the Green Wave, came out July last year. We've got the Mayor of London's current streetscape, which we hope these policies will be longer term. Um, that comes after you, the policy you mentioned earlier on and then the one cycling revolution from 2010. What do you think? Do you think there's enough sharing of policy insights um, across municipalities across the world? Could they could um, politicians and policymakers spend more time talking to each other to share these how to overcome operational and political obstacles? Uh, well, I'm a great believer in cities sharing information about all sorts of issues they deal with. And mm. I would say that, uh, uh, you know, particularly uh, New York and London are really good at sharing information. And we yeah, yeah. Uh, we have a huge amount in common, just mm. as we have a lot of things uh, that are different. Uh, mm. But uh, I find conversations with New York uh, hugely productive. And I would say mm. in terms of 
at walking and cycling, uh, you know, one of the aspects of that is that we're both cities of uh, no, not dissimilar size, big uh, cities. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm always uh, slightly concerned about uh, comparisons between uh, London and Copenhagen or London and Rotterdam. You know, Rotterdam is about the same size of Ealing, you know, which is just one of our uh, 33 uh, boroughs. So uh, these are very different issues we have to deal with. You know, what one of the uh, key c complaints you, you get in, in London from, you might say, the anti-cycling lobby is about uh, uh, lycra louts, people wearing uh, I think it's in. Uh, it's also called spandex, uh, but uh, you know, sort of uh, sporty clothes. People uh, cycling too fast. How do you control those? But you have to think that in London you have a lot of people who are commuting, uh, maybe mm. uh, 20, 25 miles, and to mm. do that at, at slow pace is just not uh, really feasible. And those are the people who uh, uh, tend to uh, cycle slightly faster than novice cyclists. And they're also the people who require some sort of facilities in offices and so on when they arrive there. If you have a much smaller area, local cycling is 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 is, is very different. And I think uh, balancing those two uh, types of uh, road users is actually uh, quite is is not easy and mm. uh, something that uh, I think we we still need to address. I mean, myself, I I I, I used to cycle as a way of uh, of getting fit for uh, longer longer rides. I, I gave that up a few years ago, and my attitude is to uh, uh, not break into a sweat uh, mm. on my bicycle. So I don't need a shower. Cycle considerately and safely and generally a little bit more slowly. doesn't seem mm. to make a great deal of difference as to the time you get somewhere. Uh, but uh, you know, my, my daily commute is, is uh, uh, mm. six miles into the office, six miles back, and I do about another 10 miles uh, it, around the time going to meetings. Uh, but mm -hmm. I could do all that without uh, uh, getting up much of a sweat, except on the, 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 the hottest days. Thank you. That is a ton of, that is a ton of cycling. It's been amazingly insightful um, uh, journey into the issues. Be, uh, that are at the forefront of sustainable mobility. I think it's really great to have both your examples of your lived experience, but also your policy insights as well. And uh, we'll really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you together and take a, I know we've referred to London and New York a lot and the States, um, but we have also, we are trying, we try to bring in other global examples as well to make comparisons. We're not trying to say urbanism is about cut and paste. I think everything, good urbanism has to be bespoke. It has to be based on lived experience. But um, thank you so much, Peter. And thank you to all of you who've made comments today. And uh, we, have, we have a few comments. Do you want to take it? Sorry? We have a few questions and comments. Oh, do we? Uh, finally. Yeah. Um, and I want to say, you know, to your previous question and comments by Peter, we actually had a ton of uh, best practices sharing from mayors of London, uh, from Ken Livingston to Boris Johnson when he was mayor, and even the recent uh, Mayor Sadiq Khan on uh, on uh, you know your congestion pricing uh, to drive out cars from central London to the super cycle high, uh, highway that you are currently building. So, um, Peter, you asked. Uh, we have a comment from Alan Crawford who says it's fifteen dollar yeah. and an no, extra pounds, fifteen dollar. Uh, sorry, 50, fifteen pounds. I keep saying dollars. Sorry, that's. It's, it's, it's controversially just gone up and uh, yeah. causing lots of tradesmen who need to carry their tools around to really, and delivery people and uh, not yeah. just, just people trying to get to work. It's caused quite a lot of consternation. That's There's a comment to uh, what the congestion pricing is currently in uh, London. We have a couple of linked questions, which we can try to, I think, which we kind of answered, but which we can quickly try to answer mm -hmm. uh, from uh, Arjun uh, on how do you, how can citizens 
pressurize government and policy making bodies to improvise improve uh, public transportation system uh, mr ashok goel asked the same question how do you persuade politicians uh, to agree to make parts of delhi city only accessible by cycles that's a million dollar question um and we have a question from francisco Bohorquez, who says, "Thank you, Mr. Murray. You have great drawings. Is it possible to see uh, your work in any publication or virtual place?" So, two different questions, but we maybe quickly address that. Uh, I'll take us a few more minutes from our broadcast. But Peter, well, I, 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 I tweet them every now and then, is it? Because I use them as a part of my advocacy, really, for particular uh, changes. So. Uh, Twitter's mainly, uh, and I, I, I do have my own website, and uh, a couple of them are on there, but not not all of them. I'll make sure they they are up there. But do feel free to download them or use them for any uh, if you wanted to use them for uh, active purposes to try and influence people. Very happy that they're used uh, to do that. Um, but uh, how do you convince? Uh, Authorities to deliver better public transport. Um, I just think that it's a really long, arduous road uh, because, as I said, you're up against real resistance from everyone from car manufacturers to taxi drivers, and uh, you need to uh, really advocate uh, for change. And I would say one of the lessons uh, one can learn is that uh, once is to you start off maybe protesting uh, but then as you uh, start to sense that uh, politicians are coming around to your way of thinking you start collaborating and helping and uh, helping to uh, press uh, their message and i think that 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 shift from uh, being a, a, a sort of protest movement to a, a, a delivery movement is mm -hmm. is is really important but it, it's 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 a tough job. I would say number one thing is to try and get Jan Gale from Copenhagen to come over and give a talk to uh, as many influential people as you possibly can. He is one of the most convincing people uh, to uh, talk about uh, how cities should be for people and not for uh, streets or for people and not uh, mere conduits for the movement of goods. And he's he's really good at putting that message over. He's retired now, uh, so he doesn't travel very much. But when he does, he has a real impact on local communities everywhere he goes. Mm. I had a great, I had the great honor of, uh, um, ha, you know, hosting him in Mumbai last year and walking him around streets of Mumbai. And you're right, we met with local councillors and political leaders and. It was a good way to open their eyes towards people-centric cities. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter, very much. Yes, and actually, if I could just personally add a comment there, I would say, yes, Jan Gale, if you can get him, he does like to travel, uh, although we're all a bit, con we're very constrained in terms of global travel at the moment. But you could work in the spirit of Gian Gale and create your own local manifesto. You know, do some research into your local areas, your neighborhoods, spell out what is wrong with them, spell out what could be better and could be so improved in terms of public health. Get some quotes from, from people on the street, put it all together, make your points, your manifesto points and... Uh, and send it to your local politicians and invite them to take part in the conversation. Um, I mean, Peter, as mayor's uh, advocate for the mayor of London, has obviously had a very, very, um, uh, let's say, very, very uh, accessible um, conversations with with politicians at the uh, at the, the um, local government in London, and and indeed politicians all around, and we've very grateful to you for, for your insights and in sustainable mobility because it, it, it is now at the very forefront of the urban conversation and it needs to stay there as well. It perhaps has been a little bit put in the background, but I think we need to have it on the agenda and give it more bandwidth constantly. 
So thank you everybody for watching and um, commenting. Thank you, Peter, again. Um, I'm very happy to say that next week, Tuesday the 30, 30th of June, at the same time, which is, uh, what have we got? We've got, um, yeah, 4.30 BST, 5.30 CST, uh, 9 p.m. IST and 11.30 EDT or check your local time zone. We've got um, the, the next session is the future of development and we have two exceptional developers, Johnny Anstead, who is the uh, co-founder of Town, works, they operate in the UK, together with um, a leading Indian developer, Surendra Hiranandani, who is the co-founder and the managing, uh, managing director of the Hiranandani Group. So um, look out for our up publicity updates on LinkedIn, and we hope to be able to tell you about some further exciting um, episodes very soon, coming to you every Tuesday without fail. Thank you very much for continuing to watch, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks. Thank you.